Hey, it's Talk Gnosis. It's a podcast and a YouTube show about Gnosticism and mysticism and the esoteric and whatever I'm interested in this week <laughs> and how I can possibly tie it into <laughs> Gnosticism, whatever that is. <laughs> We've got Craig from Acid Horizon here. Hi, Craig. Hi, how are you? Good, good. Uh, really pumped to speak to you. Uh, we're talking to you about your your awesome, amazing, uh, rad project of the Philosopher's Tarot. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm waiting for my copy to come. You, uh, you uh, generously uh, sent me a, a digital version so I could review it. And uh, I think it's something that people who are watching and listening are all going to run out and buy, and you all should. So mm -hmm. <laughs> before we kind of get into into that, uh, Craig, also everybody, just Google Philosopher's Tarot, put in your order. Can you, can you <laughs> tell us like... Uh, uh, and of course, you, you host a philosophy podcast, which is what yes. I'm about to ask for. And, you know, I think that the first question I put in is, who are you? You can answer however mm. you'd like. <laughs> okay. Who are you? What is Acid Horizon? Uh, lay it on us. Great. So my name's Craig, and I'm the host of the Acid Horizon podcast. It's a philosophy podcast. And we also have a sibling podcast called Inner Experience that probably would resonate more with the occultish, esoteric crowd. And we can talk a little bit about that later. But the basic origin story of the podcast is this. Um, well, a little bit about me. So my background, I, I, had, I had my undergraduate degree in philosophy, and I took this circuitous path out of philosophy and back to philosophy. I taught overseas in Japan for a few years. I worked odd jobs. I was a musician in, in Los Angeles for several years. And then uh, one of my sort of ending points during my time living in Los Angeles, Los Angeles is that I was a teacher in the LA County jail system. And that, that was for about three years or so. And I had worked a little bit at a college teaching in an intensive English and college prep program for um, international students. Well, while I was teaching at the jail, I was teaching philosophy, English, ESL, and a variety of subjects. The pandemic hit. And one of the places uh, that was probably the most dangerous to be, at least, you know, according to the dominant perception at the time, was a place as crowded as a, as a jail. So like everybody else who was working in schools, we went to the Zoom format and that sort of thing. And I had the good fortune of being, you know, I had a great union and I had a contract that allowed me to basically, you know, despite whatever work they were going to give me, which really wasn't quite a lot in the very beginning for at least for the first six months um, that I would be locked into my salary for at least the remainder of the year, which put me in the position of, well, what am I going to do with myself? And I think a lot of us were like that. And um, one thing that had been simmering on, on a back burner was, well, let me start a podcast or, or something. And actually what had happened was with some folks that I met on Reddit, we created a Discord server just to talk about Dulles and Gatari and anti Oedipus. And so what was fantastic was, is that in my graduate program, which was a largely driven by analytic philosophy, I didn't have as many Dulles and Gatari comrades. Now, suddenly I had about 1500 of them. <laughs> and so this was a, a wonderful experience of sorts. And I, I met some friends on that Discord server with whom we created the Acid Horizon podcast. And so the basic vision of the podcast was going to be, okay, we're going to do a little bit of Deleuze and Gattari. We're gonna do Foucault. We're going to do these post-structuralist thinkers. We're gonna do a little bit of accelerationism in, in the sort of Mark Fisher universe. And we're, you know, that's going to be our base. And then from there, <clears throat> We'll do things in ancient philosophy and, you know, maybe we'll do some philosophical problems from the analytic camp or something like that as kind of curios. And that was the kind of vision. And I remember um, <laughs> I made uh, I made the, the introduction music for the podcast. So I was an ambient musician and I thought, oh, I'll incorporate a little bit of that and um, oh, we'll, we'll get the design and stuff going. And I had I had the intro going for the very first episode and I showed it to my wife and she's like, who's going to listen to this? Right. Well, you know, within six to nine to 12 months, we actually had a pretty sizable following and, and things were going really well for us. So that's basically the gist, the origin story of Acid Horizon. And then from there, we wanted to take some new tangents. So we created a, uh, like I said, a sibling podcast called Inner Experience. And, and, and the whole idea of this is we, we stole the title from Bataille's work, Inner Experience, but the, the concept of that particular show was that we were going to explore either psychological topics or the occult or um, you know just sort of 
weirdness, you know, cryptozoology, who, who, who knows what we would do, you know, the, the way that philosophy sort of like connects with those worlds and, and just as a sort of fun little expenditure, if you will. And actually it, it ended up being more of a, a survey or a way of us to deal with like psychoanalysis, Jungian psychology, uh, the work of James Hillman, uh, who's a big figure for me. And so that was that. Now, in the midst of all of this, like I said, I had quite a bit of free time and um, I just started playing around on Photoshop. And so I started creating all these designs and some of these designs ended up being uh, a means of secondary income for me. And so I was making t-shirts and mugs and things like that. And this was really not the intention in the beginning. This was just a way to have fun. And so the very first, one of the very first designs that I created was I took the nine of swords card and I took the guy waking up out of bed and I just threw in the cockroach and I said, okay, that's, that's Kafka. That's the metamorphosis. Ha ha ha. And so I put it out there and folks said, Hey, are you going to make the whole deck? And I, I mean, at that time, the idea of doing 77 more of those was very daunting. And truth be told, my Photoshop skills were not very good at that time. And then a little bit later down the road, I did another card. Actually, a friend had come over to my house and he was wearing a t-shirt that had the Magician Tarot card, but it had Robert Smith's face from The Cure on the Magician. And I thought that was clever. And I said, oh, what philosopher would be the magician. And I, I thought Felix Gattari was a good choice for that. The, the whole idea of how do you create a body without organs, the, the, the activity of a sort of mystical materialist creation. It, it seemed appropriate that I put Gattari's face out there. And as soon as I made that image as a meme, next thing you know, people are like, are you going to do the whole deck? And I was like, there is no way that I'm going to do that deck. And, you know, I still have free time. So I was like, yeah, I'll do Dulu's. I'll do Deleuze. I have Guattari, might as well do Deleuze. And so then this is when the real inquiry began for me. And truth be told, and, and, and I'll put, you know, no pun intended, I'll put all my cards on the table here. I've only had fleeting interest with the tarot, but at very curious moments in my life. Once was a, a friend of mine had introduced to me way back when, but the other time that I encountered tarot during my life, when was when I was in recovery for cancer. And I didn't know a lot about it. I, I kind of under, undertook an exploration of the tarot via the work of James Hillman and alchemy. And I didn't get very conversant with it, but that experience with the tarot left a very strong imprint on me. And then I kind of forgot about it. And so then when, when I was thinking about Deleuze, I'm like, well, the idea of a hermit or a nomad would be good. So then I, I took a deep dive on the hermit card and started finding out things. And I was like, you know what? There, there's very strong convergences between certain aspects of Deleuze's work and this figure of the hermit. So got to the Photoshop desk, did it up, put it out there. People loved it. And they're like, ah, clearly you're on your way to creating the, the, the whole deck. And so at this time, you know, I thought, well, maybe, maybe I will do the deck. Okay, I won't do the deck, but what I will do is I will do the entire major arcana. And so from there, I started picking out figures, doing this and that, and then a real excitement was sparked in me. And then, of course, there was, there was a, nece a necessity or demand to know at least a little bit about the tarot. And so the approach that I took was initially was parody, which I think was a good instinct to go on because not only was it going to be playful, but it, it was by dint of the parody that I was able to sort of maintain my interest and take this deeper dive into some of the meanings. And then once the, 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 uh, the major arcana started to get rounded out, I was very serious about like which figures would occupy which cards and so forth uh, to the extent that in the end, what I thought was the final major arcana, I had to make a switch. And so if you look at some of my older work, like I did a poster for the original major arcana cards. And in the place of the emperor, I had Nietzsche. And then in the place of the sun, I had Freud. I thought it would be funny to put like a, a little child on a horse, you know, and that child was like kind of an Oedipalized you know, little human with, with Freud as the sun in the background, kind of staring at him with a penetrating gaze. But then it just made sense to me that I need to flip Freud and Nietzsche. 
So I put Freud in the place of the emperor, the father, the paternal figure, the figure of authority. And I put Nietzsche as the little boy on the horse. And that is the card of joy. And that seemed to resonate uh, more closely in which in the end, I thought it was really ironic given that there's this kind of synergy and maybe even a, a point of divergence to an important point of divergence between the figures of Freud and Nietzsche. And so that's the, the sort of basic origin story of the cards. I had the 24 cards done. I made a little poster, some people bought it. And then what had happened was uh, certain circumstances had urged me to leave Los Angeles. And so at this time I had the podcast going. So I had some Patreon income going and then I had my little store on the side and I began to work for Zero Books, which is now Zero and Repeater Media. So I'm the content coordinator for that channel as well. And then, you know, what had been my teaching career, you know, I had been on this, on, on this course, you know, to ultimately one day retire as a teacher. Now things didn't look good for me in that venue living in Los Angeles. My my condo was almost consumed by the fires out there. And so we escaped. And so it was at that time when I met the folks at, at uh, Repeater Books, I spoke, and, and, and maybe you know this, but Repeater Books is an imprint under Watkins Media. And so they're the big tarot card makers. And so once I started doing work for them, they sent me a little care package. And here's the interesting thing. Um, Eitan uh, Ilfield, who is essentially the, the owner or CEO of, of Watkins, sent me a whole bunch of tarot decks because he saw my designs. And he himself created a deck called the Synchronicity Tarot, which I'm not sure if you've ever seen this, but essentially it's a series of hexagonal cards and they have all sorts of um, little figures and almost, it, it almost looks like clip art in a way. And I, I shuffled the deck as good as one could shuffle it. And well, just to make you understand what had happened during that deal was all of the cards. I mean, what are the chances of all of the cards having the same symbol in the deal? So, and, and the symbol was the pie sign, a circle completion. And I'm looking at the deck and I was like, you know what, this is just so odd. Well, what does this mean? And so it just immediately, immediately hit me as like, well, maybe I can make a tarot deck, which was very odd. So uh, it was an odd insight, I should say. And so I contacted the folks at Repeater. And I said, hey, I've been kind of working on this. Um, would you guys be interested in making this philosopher's tarot deck? And they almost immediately said yes. But the deadlines were intense because there was like a new printing season coming up. And ordinarily, what would have been about a year's worth of time taken on creating a tarot deck, I had like eight months. But granted, I had the 24, or I'm sorry, I had the, the entirety of the Major Arcana and, and, and a few other cards besides. And so it was at that point that I was like, wow, I really got to buckle down and learn this tarot and, and, and at least get some semblance of an understanding uh, of these images. And then I had to figure out what am I going to do with all of these minor Arcana cards as well? So that was another challenge that was put in front of me. But before long, I realized this is actually a really fun project. I took it very seriously, but at the same time, I wanted to inject a lot of fun into the deck. And so if you read the little booklet that I gave, uh, I gave you a, uh, the digital copy of, you'll notice that I use this concept of heretical decalcomania. And so what I thought would be interesting was, is I'm going to take these images and in the manner of Deleuze and Gattari, if you're familiar with the concept of a rhizome, right? A rhizome connects at all of these different points versus a tree, arborescence, it has a singular growth point, an origin from which all of the branches extend. But what Deleuze and Gattari say is you can actually form a rhizome by combining two arborescences, like taking two trees and slamming them together, essentially, right? Or, and so what I did was, I thought, well, I'm going to just take certain images and just slap them on the tarot. Like in the case of the Kafka card, I'm just going to slap these decals. I'm here. I'm going to throw the uh, the cockroach over here. I'm going to throw the before the wall wall in the back of the 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 moon card, for example. Um, and I was just going to kind of, you know, 
kind of create a little collage, if you will. And then I had to do some drawing for it too. I was, I was into art in high school, but I'll tell you, it was very difficult to come back with a digital pen and try to redraw some of these things or incorporate my own drawings, which you'll see into some of the cards, but everything actually worked out really nicely, or at least it worked out a lot better than I, I had uh, originally anticipated. And so after a couple of months of doing that, we went to print, which was, I think, May of this year. And actually the cards, the official release date for the cards is tomorrow, May 8th. But as I understand it, they've already been shipping and um, things are going well. Amazing. So my next question is, what is a tarot deck? Better yet, <laughs> what can a tarot deck do? That's, that's the question that I ask in my booklet. And so, you know, one of the things that I failed to mention is that that when I lived in Los Angeles, I was involved in some left-wing activism. I was involved with a party for a short time. And then for various reasons I left, or one of the main reasons was is, is that I began working in the jail system and, and that took up a lot of my time. And one of the challenges that I always had was how, how do you maintain, and this is sort of Deleuze Gattarian question is, how do you maintain a sort of sustainable pack, an assemblage of people who are interested in, you know, your, your causes, your struggles, but at the same time allowed for a lot of porousness, you know, for people to kind of move in and out of that group. But, you know, how, how could we also create a, a sense of metastable cohesion amongst this group? And I, I thought a great way was to get gather up a lot of philosophers that that folks you know who share the same interests as me are interested in and create essentially this sort of um this touchstone in the form of a tarot deck and so at the time that i created the podcast and got online and and, and to be honest i wasn't on twitter or anything like that i was on reddit a little bit um prior to the pandemic but once i got online i i met all of these these people it got me into philosophers. Like during the pandemic is when I really got into Bataille for the first time. And I thought, well, what would be interesting in it is, is to take the community of these philosophers um, that this community is interested in and creating this array of images and references that we can all share. And so I thought this was an interesting way to sort of bring together like-minded individuals to create this massive assemblage. Like, what started out as a meme could be something a, a, a bit more useful. And I, I thought it would also be interesting to create a tarot deck that not only aligns these philosophical figures, but also has revolutionary figures, a few villains as it were, and, and just kind of mash them together in this big bundle of fun. And I think, I think that goal um, has been achieved more or less. Uh, I mean, I've, I've met a lot of great, interesting, and wonderful folks as a result of this. Um, and it has allowed me to, you know, make the kinds of connections that keep this enterprise going and, and even do other things in the future. Yeah. You know, it almost reminds me of, uh, I really like, and we'll talk about this momentarily, but mm -hmm. I've always really liked the, the romantic legends about the origins of tarot. Uh, like mm -hmm. I got into tarot uh, as a teenager, I had the Stuart Kaplan Encyclopedia of, of Tarot books, and it had like, you mm -hmm. know, these, the, all the numerous origin stories. But one of them was, uh, it was after the fall of the Library of Alexandria, or after, you know, maybe the fall of Byzantium, who knows, right? Mm -hmm. After some fall, uh, different scholars uh, are dispersed across the world, and they need a system to bring themselves uh, together uh, that uh, has uh, uh, that can cross uh, boundaries, that can cross languages, right? Mm. So they they make the tarot to uh, to uh, bring brings these societies of dispersed philosophers and mystics together. Anyways, I thought that was kind of a neat synchronicity with that. That mm. story is almost certainly not true. Uh, I love <laughs> it, but uh, it's almost a neat synchronicity with why you made this deck. So maybe mm. maybe there's maybe there's something to that story if it's not uh, literally true. Uh, Craig, mm -hmm. what is a philosopher? What is a philosopher? Well, I think principally a philosopher is someone who creates concepts. Um, I think this is, this is the definition of philosopher that you get from Deleuze and Deleuze and Gattari. And, um, you know, there's a big debate about, you know, 
who is, just the, the question that you asked, who is a philosopher? You know, is this a, a category of elite individuals? Um, I think you'll find today there, there's been a, a kind of democratization of philosophy uh, in the sense that, you know, in the times that we live in, information is widely available. The way that we utilize our time and the, you know, the kind of communities that we're able to create allow all kinds of people to do creative and interesting things with with philosophy. And I think at various times in our, our lives, all of us can be philosophers if we venture the risk of creating a concept, right? Being able to step outside the frameworks that we ordinarily maintain and, and using interesting things like literature and art and um, you know, finding within the interstices of those creative disciplines, new ways to think about discourse and the non-discursive. And so I think, I mean, granted, there are people who are self-described philosophers. Um, I would say myself as a philosopher, often I find my, myself just, you know, kind of reading and recapitulating what I've read. The question is, am I doing philosophy in those moments? You know, if, if I'm just, you know, sort of uttering a homily to my favorite philosophies or, you know, just creating a podcast, I think there are moments in those podcasts uh, and in, in, in those meditations where one does become philosophical. And um, I, I look to Deleuze again here uh, because I think one of the important questions when it comes to philosophy is how do we make sense of those non-philosophical moments in our life? Often the, the import or the philosophical import of something that happens in our life doesn't come until much later once some experience is is had or um you know an understanding of ourselves is consummated in some way and i think i think for example the creation of acid horizon and in the tarot deck was one of those moments for me you know after my undergraduate and then going moving off into a career field i didn't anticipate this kind of return to philosophy but what i found is a lot of the skills that I acquired, the relationships that I created and so on, have fallen back upon this project. And actually, I would say that my ability to do philosophy has been greatly enriched by that departure from philosophy. And so I think that's an important part of undertaking, undertaking a philosophical lifestyle is having these sort of divergent modes of experiencing the world and stepping out of discourse. Yeah. Um at different periods in, in sort of Greek history and the Greek philosophical tradition, there's this idea that to be a philosopher, uh, one must also do contemplation or, and even theurgy or theurgy. Like, did you mm. see this tarot deck as a way to introduce that back into philosophy for philosophers mm. to, to do these acts or people who want to be philosophers? Because it, it doesn't seem to be quite that mainstream of an idea for a long time now. Right. Well, I, I think... What's useful, I mean, th this deck I think is useful and I have already heard heard about and seen to a limited extent some teachers of philosophy using the deck in the classroom. So that was one of the goals of this deck too was that it had a pedagogical purpose. And I don't know about you and, and since you're, you're more immersed in the tarot world than, than I am, um, if you step into a bookshop like Barnes and Noble here in the United States or wh wherever the sort of similar variant of that is, wherever you live, these days it's not uncommon to see young, curious minds, you know, navigate their way to the shelf where all the tarot stuff is. Um, there's a big question mark there for me whether or not what they're getting from, you know, the sort of popular tarot materials that are available is going to be enriching for them. I mean, and the same goes for philosophy too. If you looked at <laughs> look at what's stacked on the philosophy shelves at your, you know, Barnes and Noble store or something like that, you know, are they getting something radical? Are they going to get something that's transformative? Are they are they going to get something that that really, you know, expands their mind? And I thought, how would it, like, what needs to happen in this world to kind of create a new kind of consciousness or a way of seeing the world that maybe avoids some of the stodginess of philosophy, has some of the excitement of the tarot, and brings together the imagination and critical reason. 
And I thought the tarot would was an excellent way to do this. Now, this was not on my mind, you know, when I started making these memes. But when I really saw the impact that it had on people, it made me think there's there's life here. There's an energy here that that can be exploited in, in the best of possible ways. And so I thought if we could create this convergence between an interest in tarot and the mysticism um, and and philosophy and I, I, I mean, to get the tarot deck, you have 78 images in hand. Um, many of which are explicated in the booklet that I gave you. You know, there's a possibility that I will do another book on this in the future. But um, this is a, a great introduction to philosophy as well. And so I wish I had had something like this when I first began philosophy because it would have given me a very quick way to flip through images, names, and concepts. And then I could chase those hairs down on my own time. Um, but we didn't have anything like that growing up. But now we do have something like that. So th this is why I, I see this as an important project. Yeah. So the, uh, earlier I mentioned uh, tarot origins and, and all the, the sort of fantastical stories that uh, are associated with it. So they're probably not actually hieroglyphs from ancient Egypt mm -hmm. or the lost wisdom of Atlantis. But, but mm -hmm. I've never bought the story that, that tarot is just playing cards. Right. There seems to me to be a Neoplatonic Renaissance system in the Visconti Sephora cards, which are the, the oldest deck that we have. Like, do you see the cards as inherently philosophical? I got a bunch of nested questions here. Uh, <laughs> what about all the meanings and systems endlessly layered on over the last 200 years? Two mm -hmm. question marks. What about Jung, Hillman, archetypes? Three question marks. So uh, <laughs> good luck with all that. Wow. All right. So where to begin? Well, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Ted, who was on our tarot program, which I think was about a year ago, maybe a little bit more than a year ago now. I think we share a common conception here. I, I think the tarot, I mean, in the most crass sense, can be a kind of a heuristical device, right? But when we, I think when we sort of drill into the notion of tarot as a heuristic, what we get is, as you're suggesting, you know, a, a, an entire history of, of meanings that come from the Renaissance and maybe even from before that. But I think there's also a risk there that the meanings or the traditional meanings, the orthodoxy of tarot can foreclose upon the imagination of readers of the tarot or the querent. And I think, you know, the kind of, it, at least for myself, the kind of experiment that I decided to undertake, I think kind of honors the late Jung or the work of Hillman in some sense in that we don't get trapped in these sort of symbological reductions of the tarot. I think, I think this blend of orthodoxy, intuitive readings, and the act of creation of, you know, creators of new tarot decks and, and querents and just tarot enthusiasts alike is important to enlivening this tradition and, and to continue the enlivenment of the tradition. And so, you know, maybe to put a finer point on, on the question about what, what do I think about all of this, or maybe like what, how does this chalk up in terms of an approach to the tarot, I, I want here I defer to Hillman in, 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 in some aspect. I think it's it's good to read up on on tarot meanings. Uh, of course, it's if you're using the philosopher's tarot, I think having a knowledge of philosophy is very important as well, too. But I think the there's a sort of intuitive dimension to you know the act of reading the tarot that that needs to be cultivated in order for us to get out of it what's most important and i think second only second only to developing a relationship with the cards once you start fostering these associations learning a little bit about the history and you don't need to know the whole history but i think once you develop important associations i think the the, the chance nature of the reading kind of stretches that heuristic muscle of, of yours and 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 taps your creativity and taps your intuition and so in that sense um, I, I think maybe this is part of the materialist mysticism that I want to talk about, which simply means that we have this sort of phenomenological approach of sticking to the image in the sort of Hillmanian sense of things that allows us to be creators of meaning and not just receivers of it, right? And so that there's a sort of like, you know, dialectic between creation and reception of meaning 
which of course has a, a communal dimension to it too. And so as we share meanings with, with those who are interested in philosophy or tarot, for example, this, this allows us, you know, to, to come to know ourselves and to come to know our problems through this heuristical device, which I think at the end of the day is, is just very fun. It's exciting. It's enlivening. And um, I, I'm very honored to, I don't know, like I said, this, there's a sort of hero's journey element to all of this, which is I refused the call so many times. I, I did not want to create the tarot deck in the beginning and tarot kind of came in and out of my life at important times. But now that we're here, I'm very glad um, that, I'm very glad that I was able to create this deck. And, and I think I did so in the spirit of, of values that I think are transformative. Yeah, yeah. I really like how, how you mentioned it, it being uh, bringing together a combination of the imagination and the critical uh, faculties, because even, mm -hmm. even going back to its Neoplatonic heritage, you know, I, I think that's an importance. Uh, I think that's what a lot of the Neoplatonists were trying to do, maybe mm -hmm. possibly even the, the Gnostics uh, before them. Uh, and, um, where was I going with that? I was going to say something smart and cool, Craig. But <laughs> it was, oh man, it was going to blow your mind. Everybody watching, it was going to blow their minds. Um, but instead, I'll give you something bad and worse, which is our Patreon commercial. Hey, okay. everybody, we need money. Because uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's how this world works, unfortunately. So uh, you, you can help us continue to do the show for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. You can put a cap on that. We usually do four to six pieces of media per month. Uh, we try to do more. We haven't lately, and uh, we don't charge for them. Uh, we don't give you anything, but you get early access to the show. And actually, I, I'm busy. Me and my wife are busy incarnating uh, a, a pure soul from the pleroma into a, uh, a flesh prison. So I'm going to be <laughs> going to be taping not this show this one's coming out soon uh, i'm going to be pre-taping a lot of shows folks so you're going to get access to all of those so the the entire secret archive of taped in advance shows as well as we give early access uh we don't want to put anything behind the paywall because we want to get the light of gnosis out there maybe it's the darkness of gnosis i don't know <laughs> paypal.me slash gnostic for one-time donations also if you can't help us out financially i completely understand just tell people about the show share it like subscribe all that good stuff Okay, uh, Craig. Yes. Why do you think tarot has become so popular lately? That's interesting. Um, when I when I joined the team at Repeater Books, um, it seemed that there 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 has been um, an extensive interest um, in what I would call new epistemologies. Um, or just different epistemologies. Uh, there, there might be a, a few good reasons for this. Um, my brother, who's actually into mysticism and shamanism, and he's also politically active and those sorts of things, actually had an inter interesting response to this, which was, you know, given the experience of the pandemic and the sort of media phenomenon of the pandemic and, and the Trump era and the post-Trump era, I think there was... A, a sort of war for truth, as it were, or a, a, a war for the uh, epistemology, if you will, um, which maybe cause some people to call in to doubt certain frameworks. And I think, you know, the world as we see it now, there's a, there's a deepening of crises of, you know, at the ecological level and, you know, with work and the economy and so forth. And I think this is something that that people turn to when other ideas just don't pan out for them. Um, and that's why, you know, for, for myself, I thought it was important that, you know, like even I had this impulse to go to this thing coming from a philosophical tradition, right? Because there's a sort of energy or air uh, about mysticism, you know, that can be exciting and enlivening. And I think too, you know, being somebody who's sympathetic to the ideas of James Hillman, and being somebody who grew up in the Catholic Church, uh, I think the the sort of experiment with pantheistic imagery, and particularly the tarot itself, as being a, somewhat of a derivation of that. And in, in any in any case, we we have a sort of faceting of the mystical or a faceting of the phenomenological with the tarot. We get to see many sides and dimensions of our experience through the lens of not only individual cards, but you know various various um, 
you know, like the Celtic cross and, and so forth, you know, the various ways of, of using the tarot. So I thought that, you know, there's always something to the idea of experiencing something through chance um, and, you know, encountering a mystery, if you will. And I, I think the tarot is, is a very strong vehicle for that. Yeah. Again, to come back to imagination, I, I'm really glad mm -hmm. that, that, that you did bring it up because I, I feel like sometimes people feel like it's, it's cheating or it's wrong if you're talking about some of the the fun, attention-grabbing, uh, imaginal uh, uh, aspects of of the mystical and of the esoteric. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm quite fond of, of 19th century occultism, right, and, mm -hmm. and of some of the esoteric mm -hmm. orders related to that. Where I feel like for smart philosophical people who do have interest in the esoteric, they always have to put little asterisks on when they talk mm. about that era, right? right. Um, because they, they find it a little bit embarrassing. But but I would argue that, that you know, this may not be the path for everybody, but, you know, putting on these silly little costumes and doing your silly little rituals by candlelight and then talking about esoteric philosophy, it, it really does uh, stimulate the imagination. It really mm -hmm. does give fuel. It really does uh, take you, it really can take you out of, your, out of yourself so that you can mm -hmm. see things from a different perspective and mm -hmm. you know my, my argument would be that you know this is very much like uh uh, uh play acting that that uh but at the same time it's it's very important and it's very powerful but i feel like like people feel like if, if you just uh straight up admit that it's like mm -hmm. it's like you're you're cheating or you're trying to trick people yeah i i have an explanation for that and maybe you'll be sympathetic to it i i think I think we can use the the work of George Bataille here to help us, which is, I think the the longstanding cultural emphasis on rationality mm -hmm. has produced a kind of shame about these sorts of things. Um, I think, I mean, maybe to a certain extent, even the monotheistic tradition, as having been sort of glued onto, um, you know secular forms of rationality may have been dispiriting for some people. So when we have this impulse to move towards these occult objects or occult epistemologies, I think what it speaks to is that which is not appropriable by the rational order of things. I think, I think mystery and I think wonder and chance are, are such they're, they're kind of a dejecta of rationality. And so our ability to, to recover, you know, what and I say recover, embrace practices that foster that sort of thing, that foster the imagination and um, not only pay homage to, but understand that. And, and once again, I go to Hillman here. We all live steeped in fantasies. We, we live steeped within a system of signs. And so the phenomenological dimension of, of our reality and our experience is, is colored by all kinds of images, motif, mythologems. And I think, it's, I think once we uh, positively encounter something like the tarot, for instance, it gives us a substance to work with that you know, has a sort of colloidal effect with that unconscious element of us. It attaches to it and it enriches our lives. Now, does this mean that we, you know, refuse, you know, utility and rationality whole cloth? No, uh, of course it doesn't. But I think attending to the imaginal dimension of our experience, you know, offers us a sense of rich, richness, a, a heuristic, and an ability to see, for example, like when we face threats, crises, new relationships, what sort of imaginal elements are at work. And so whether it's using the tarot, for example, or something like the archetypes, I, I find all of that quite useful. And I think if we can, if we can embrace those things with, with a sense of humor and with, with a sense of parody, I think that's, that, that's important as well. I, I often think of Jodorowsky's The Holy Mountain. For me, the, the, the final scene of the movie says it all. The camera pulls back, hey, this is just all a production back here. And to have that, that sort of like last ironic gesture or parodic gesture, if you will, I think is important to sort of stemming maybe some of the dangers that, that uh, are involved with the occult. You know, maybe there is a way that we can kind of fall into, you know, this kind of dark soup and never return, right? 
and I think this is where humor comes into it. Yeah. It, it, humor is, it, it's so important. Do you think that this is the way or the only way or there are other ways? What's the right way to ask this? Okay. So both like Vajrayana and occultism, they, they have like these long standing traditions that if you, if you do it wrong, you'll go insane. Right, that, mm. that's one madness is, is one of the possible uh, bad side of, bad, bad side effects, and and I think about that when, you know, because people who get into occultism or even Jungianism uh, mm -hmm. sometimes go crazy, right, right. Uh, in in mm -hmm. on, on on helpful ways. You know, they're mm. they they live in a world of, of magic and wonders. They're constantly looking for signs. You know, I have a, I have a, a friend who's a philosopher who's a, a Lacanian, but a, a, had started in, in Jungian treatment, right? And it said, mm -hmm. you know, it basically gave me a psychotic break. I was wandering around looking for synchronicities, and and uh, so like you know, you can lose your your house, you can lose mm -hmm. your your wife, yeah. you can lose your dog, you can lose everything if you go too hard right that's right uh with yeah. these intuitions uh with these magical ideas you know, reading your dreams so how how do we find this balance is is it having this this healthy sense of humor this healthy sense of parody that we can you know uh, stay stay a bit grounded yeah i think so and i think the the what we would ordinarily call the more rational dimension of philosophy can help with with that i think we get into trouble when we I mean, not that I see this very often, but people who like reject science whole cloth. I, I think, I think having a sort of healthy ecology of epistemologies is what creates, you know, I, I say a balanced individual, but it's not necessarily that that we should be pursuing equilibrium. I think we should be pursuing a healthy disequilibrium, right? That that we have something that elicits within us this this energy, this 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 zest for life. If if we if we push too hard on the equilibrium piece, I think we can create our own prison. But if we deterritorialize too quickly, as you're suggesting, you know, we can have this psychotic break that that takes us far beyond the place, you know, that would that we could consider healthy growth or health, healthy expression, if you will. Yeah. Um, let's look at all 78 cards. Okay. Individually. No. <laughs> let's, let's look at a few let's of the cards it. in detail as, as examples. Wow. I mean, I would love to. So, yeah, we can do a 78 part mini series. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so, so I, I more or less randomly picked three, not quite random, but mm -hmm. I found them intriguing. Sure. But I find the whole deck intriguing, hence, hence mm -hmm. random. If I had the deck here, I would have drawn three. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. sure. But uh, the first one I was wondering about is, is the devil, Hegel. So, so you, chose, you chose Hegel as the devil because of his writing style. <laughs> well, and I mean, he looks hilarious too. Like yeah. just Hegel's head with that, that red shawl, um, you know, on Satan's body is is just amazing for me. So that that was actually, and once again, like my intuition was, oh, Hegel has to be the devil. Well, it's kind of a joke. Adam, who is on our podcast, um, is a, a sort of expert on Hegel. Um, and he Hegel is a big part of his work in uh, his PhD. And being somebody who's more sympathetic towards Deleuze, you know, we, when we first had met, there were kind of like fun, playful battles back and forth between each other. And so as a joke, I'm like, yeah, I'm putting, I'm putting Hegel's head on the devil card. But then once I had done that and I recalled and, and basically grounded my own knowledge of, of the tarot a little bit more strongly, um, I find that, well, actually, there's some synergies between the, the devil card and the work of Hegel, especially in the phenomenology of spirit. And actually, Adam helped me out with this a little bit. Um, as I understand it, there's a couple predominant meanings for the, the devil card. And please correct me. Like As I understand it, bondage, materialism, excess. Often this card refers to things like addiction as well. Well, the, the, the image that we locked into was this, this notion of bondage and what Hegel calls the way of despair, that this search for truth and the, the sort of maturation of consciousness involves traversing this series of errors, right? We, we, we embody, a, you know, we engender a certain intellectual framework and then it breaks down. And in this sort of negative breaking down, it builds back up and then we move on to the, this newer, more rarefied framework and so forth until we get to absolute knowledge. The problem is this involves a series of errors. So we are kind of bound and tethered to the negative via our inability to fully uh, circumscribe the truth. And I mean, the interesting thing with Hegel is you really only get the truth 
once you're dead, <laughs> right? That's our achievement of the absolute is at the end of our life, all is revealed to us. And um, so there is there is this sort of other thing that we could get into here. But I, I thought there was something interesting, like there's a kind of battalion reading of the card as well, insofar as, you know, one of the things that Bataille reacted to in Hegel was is that Hegel, you know, completed the system of German idealism, or at least on his own terms, and made it difficult to philosophize beyond it, or at least to understand our lives in a kind of immediate sense, in, in the sort of, or in the sort of inner experience sense that Bataille talks about. Um, and I thought that was an interesting way to look at the card is like, how do we get out of the bondage of a figure who's so magnanimous like Hegel in philosophy and assert ourselves philosophically or existentially against him? And so I see this kind of tension between this notion of bondage and a notion of release or escape uh, from, from the system in the sort of battalion sense of things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I could also see a bit of a, you know, the the actual figure of the devil in the card, right? You wait, wait, and Coleman are and Coleman Smith are, are thinking of of the Baphomet, who's kind of a paradoxical, contradictory, dialectical figure, just inherently. Mm. And of course, the, the sort of dialectical uh, uh, figures that that are chains to this contradictory being. Nice. So, um, okay, moving on. Uh, the moon <laughs> sure. with, with Kafka. Yeah. Moon. So this is actually one of my favorite cards in the deck. I, I almost wish it were a little bit more visually compelling compared to the others, that is. But what my attempt to do was, man, I, I mean, I had known about the Moon card prior to making the deck, and I know that one of the dominant associations is illusion, right? The, the kind of you know, maybe the existential traps that we can fall into due to, you know, misperceptions or illusions. And I thought it would be interesting to put Kafka on there, particularly, I actually did my master's thesis on Kafka and Deleuze. And one of the interesting things about, or one of the sort of more uh, interesting things about the Deleuzean, uh, deleuze gatarian analysis of Kafka is this notion of an abstract machine that they believe the short stories of Kafka tend to embody in, in, in a more in a sort of unique way as compared to the longer tales of Kafka. And so part of my master's thesis was about reading all of these short stories, namely Before the Law and also, um, well, many others, and we'll see them on the card. And you'll see that I have the metamorphosis figure. I have the cockroach there here. I'll, I'll, I'll put it on the camera right now. I have the, the cockroach. I have the, the dog and the fox, which I imagine to be the investigations of a dog story. And then I have before the wall in the background and you see the, the Tartar knight standing at the gate. And then up above in the moon, we have the moon locked in the, the cog as it were. So I thought that was an interesting sort of confluence of, of, of Kafkan stories. And in this idea that maybe illusions are fostered by our ideological capture by certain machines, as it were. Um, I mean, I look at I look at the metamorphosis as someone who, you know, in their transformation into a cockroach. In the story, one of the first things that Gregor Samsa says is like, "Oh, here I am in this cockroach body. I got to get up. I got to go to work." You know, somebody who does is not conscious of the fact, or you know, looks past the, the, the fact that I've, I've been turned into a monstrosity, but yet the real monstrosity is the fact that we're so captured by the ideological system that we live within that, you know, when we have a medical crisis like becoming a cockroach, we think that we need to get into the office place. <laughs> so I thought that was just kind of a nice way to situate all those images. And uh, the Empress, you have Hypatia. Hypatia. So hy this is the card that I probably knew the least about. And one of the things I wanted, I had to honor many masters for for the, the creation of this deck. Uh, like, like I said, I wanted to create the deck for myself. I wanted to create it for the community. I wanted to create it to be representative of the history of philosophy, um, not just times and places, but different cultures, peoples, colors, races, and so forth. Um, I had known about Hypatia. I know uh, you know of her being an, a Neoplatonist. And so I, I just kind of researched her her history a little bit and finding out that you know in, in a sense she's kind of the uh, a feminist before the fact of 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 being a feminist and as i understand it she was basically killed by you know 
uh, street marauders, you know, of a very strong Orthodox Christian bent, you know, who did not appreciate her um, her exploits as a Neoplatonist and as an academic. And I thought her, you know, as sort of, you know, I like to imagine Hypatia as sort of creating or instituting this um, position or this figure of the feminist academic. And so that's that's why I chose her for this card. Yeah. So coming back to something that, that you mentioned earlier on in the interview that I was wondering if you can expand upon, which is materialist mysticism. Uh -huh. and, and do you think now, I mean, three or four times in this interview, I have questions, you know, why now? Um, mm -hmm. And it might be the same answer each time, but who knows? We'll find out. What is materialist mysticism? And mm -hmm. do you think right now is, is particularly an interesting time for, for work on the concept? Um. I, I think so. Um, and so I guess a materialist mysticism maps more or less onto what Deleuze and Guattari say about a materialist psychiatry uh, in the sense that, I mean, one of, one of the problems with psychoanalysis historically is the sort of pitched social relations that happen within the psychoanalytic tableau. You have this, the analyst who's like the paternal father figure, you the analysand, almost like a child. I mean, in the traditional Freudian sense, typically all of your attitudes, behaviors, and um, idiosyncrasies are reduced to this Oedipal figure, right? And this is the sort of, you know, reductive you know, Freudian uh, look at things. I mean, things have changed since then, of course. But imagine if there was a kind of uh, a taking back or a, an appropriation of not only psycho psychoanalysis and in, in the form of things like depth psychology, uh, but what if we did that with mysticism in the same way that James Hillman encourages us to do image work in a kind of communal way. And I'm thinking of the work of like Mary Watkins, for example, who's tried to pull psychoanalysis out of the psychoanalyst room and put it not just into group therapy, but actually like political groups and community groups and that sort of thing. Can, can we do image work as like a communal activity? Um, how could we do mysticism in this, this kind of rhizomatic way? Right. Um, and, and granted, my experience and my knowledge of, of mysticism, you know, pales in comparison to what I, I know about these other things. But I like the idea of, you know, mysticism, in, in, at least in the form of the tarot. I like the idea of that kind of profaning the world of philosophy and philosophy entering into the world of mysticism and to create this confluence and just to see what works there in the here and now. and. I mean, the way that I see it, you know, I, I come back, you know, to to the sort of like original or the most important philosophical impetus is, you know, is the right now I think is the ecological crisis. I mean, not not to mention just the ongoing exploitation that is neoliberal global capitalism. We need to marshal all of our forces, <laughs> right? And we need to make allies across different forms of epistemology. Uh, and, and for me, that means, you know, how can we activate our imaginations in ways to break us out of, of these frameworks that, you know, are limiting? Deleuze and Guattari's fundamental question is, you know, why is it that people pursue their um, servitude as if it were their salvation? And I think to get leverage on that question is we need to step outside of ourselves, maybe approach something that's a little bit risque. Or maybe something that we've already, you know, due to some sort of pre-conscious bias, you know, eliminate, eliminated from the horizon of our possibilities. And I think an encounter with mysticism could do that. Yeah, I'd also say that that's a central question to, to the Gnostics and Gnosticism as well. But, okay, have you, Craig, have yes. you ever heard of a, a French philosopher named Deleuze? <laughs> yes, um, <I> have. <laughs> okay, it's, it's, it seems to me, and this might be confirmation bias, that there has been a, a bit of a surge in interest in Deleuze mm -hmm. uh, in, in the last few years. So I'm wondering if, if, if I'm right in that observation. I'll start start mm -hmm. there. If you've also noticed it, and again, like I uh, 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 prophesized before, that I will ask why. <laughs> um, I think so. I think there has been multiple uh, resurgences of Deleuze within the past 20 years. Um, I, I don't know if I can accurately chart, you know, his influence and popularity in academia and in para-academia over the past 20 to 30 years, but, you know, there, there was kind of 
in the beginning, you know, around the time that my the person who was my thesis chair was doing work on Deleuze, there was only a handful of people doing it. And then I think with you know the uh, the rise of accelerationism, the popularity of CCRU, Nick Land, Mark Fisher, and those sorts of things, we saw another little bump. And I think around the time of the pandemic, we saw yet another bump there. I think for a lot of philosophers, especially philosophers who aren't Deleuzean, maybe are, you know, they consider themselves Hegelians or they're coming from some other angle in the continental tradition. I think it's, you know, there's no, there's no dispute that you have to get past Deleuze. In a sense, he's kind of like the, the bar right now um, for for philosophy like like if we need if we want to go beyond and and we should i don't think we should be cultish in in our love of Deleuze and Gattari i think the question is you know maybe there's a new way to think the negative again right maybe you know that this this sort of perennial question of the crisis of the negative could be an impasse to doing the sorts of things politically that that are required you know to to get to the next whatever it is we're going to but also at the same time, you know, to be able to navigate the dangers of, of the negative. Um, with that said, I think, uh, you know, the, the importance, the, the thing that's interesting about Deleuze is this, and, and I can really only speak from my experience at the end of the day. I came to Deleuze after having been heavily involved in Marxist literature, a tri I, what do I would call traditional Marxist literature because Deleuze and Gattari do claim they are Marxists and we should believe that. There's good reasons for that. Um, anarchist literature and so forth. When I encountered Deleuze, I have to admit, I was attracted by the very sort of sexy language. You know, there's a lot of interesting concepts and in, in, in wordplay and bringing in literature and in, in, in film and so forth. And it didn't seem weighed down by the kind of... Um, you know, to use a Hillmanian terms, the kind of Senex, Saturnine energy that, you know, the, the sort of traditional Marxist uh, literature had. There's a kind of play operative here. And I mean, maybe that comes through in the sort of like Nietzschean accent that it has. Yeah. But on the surface, you know, it looks, it looks so fun and playful. But once you start drilling down, you realize Deleuze is serious business. You know, not only does he have a very, you know, vast, you know, um, grip on the on the history of philosophy, but you know, he's 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 created a set of concepts that, you know, as I said, you know, kind of stand now as 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 modern day monuments. And I think in order for us to be able to think the new, we have to get past Deleuze somehow. And so with that said, I, I think Deleuze will keep popping up until I think we encounter a, a, a new philosopher. Well, uh, that's about all I have. I'm sure we could go <laughs> all day long. As I said, there, there's still 75 more cards to <laughs> go true. through, but we should probably wrap up. Uh, Craig, we, we put this out both on YouTube and as a podcast. We have mm -hmm. been throwing up some links on the screen, but for those listening, to tell them where, where they can find you, where they can find uh, the Acid Rides and all that good stuff, where they can buy the deck. Uh, yeah. Sure, sure. So, um, so first and foremost, um, if you navigate to our Twitter page, which is Acid, Acid Horizon Podcast, we have a convenient Linktree account that has all of our links. And so you can link to our Patreon page. You can buy the deck almost anywhere books are sold online, like Amazon and stuff like that. But you can actually get them directly from Repeater Books. And, and right now, like I said, I'm doing some work for Repeater and Zero Books by being their, their content coordinator uh, on YouTube. And um, so definitely check those out too. Also, if you want the tarot designs on a t-shirt or a mug. I have a store, critdrip.com, and that's also in the set of links, and that actually helps support me. So, And I just want to say, if you're listening and you have supported me, I, I just can't thank everybody enough because this has been a real opportunity for me to really do something different with my life. And I, I not that I see it as an obligation, but it, it gives me great pleasure to give back um, to to our listeners and try to you know get new interviews and you know um, you know get different authors on our shows so that 
you know, we, we can create a great archive of, you know, philosophical knowledge and just enjoy philosophy together. Uh, aside from that, uh, just a shout out to Adam and Will and everybody who's helped out with the podcast. If you go to our link tree, they have blogs that you should definitely read. And about a year from now, we will have a book out on repeater books called Anti-Oculus, the, uh, the Philosophy of Escape. And you can check the cover for that on our pinned tweet on our Twitter page. And uh, that's all I'll say about that for now. The contents of a book are, are secret for the time being. Well, it sounds extremely cool. You all should come on the show and tell us all about it when it comes out. Uh, well, quickly, I'll do my plugs. Uh, Mylandmeditation.substack.com. I do free, open, secular mindfulness meditation every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. online. Uh, that's Eastern uh, time, uh, Montreal time, uh, New York time. Uh, so come on out. It's free. It's fun. Good crowd. We just meditate together. It's, it's for everybody. Uh, if you're interested in Gnosticism and you're around Montreal, holy grail.substack.com is my parish uh, our venue closed uh, during the pandemic so we actually are doing some stuff online uh, we're hoping to go back to in person soon so check it out if you're around or if we are doing online uh, stuff go there okay uh, I, I think that's it uh, Craig thanks so much all right thank you have a good one you too. all right